thank you very much. And uh, before we start, I I'll just get the legal uh, warning out of the way. So this, this presentation contains a, a, a number of forward-looking statements, and as a result of that, should not be used as the basis for investing in shell equities. <laughs> but with that done, uh, so tonight we're going to take a journey into, into the future. Throughout, uh, we're going to look right through to the end of this century, and we're going to look at the climate issue and think about ways in which the Paris Agreement might be realized, the goals of the Paris Agreement. And in Shell, we have practiced scenario planning for nearly 50 years. And this is a scenario that we have developed over the last two years since the Paris Agreement was, uh, was negotiated. And it's, it's helped us think about what the Paris Agreement means. And I hope helps you also think about what it means for society and what it means for changes in our energy system and our lifestyles uh, throughout this century. But to visit the future, it's helpful perhaps to start in the past. And uh, th this story starts back in 1912. And uh, this was a time when Shell, in fact, was sponsoring Scott's expedition to Antarctica. And in 1912, if you'd gone to the Middle East and you know, where, where much of the world's crude oil comes from today, the big cities of the Middle East that we see today may have looked like this. And if you'd gone to my home country, uh, Australia, and uh, visited this small town, which is called Braidwood, uh, quite, near the, quite near Canberra, um, and you'd opened up the local newspaper in July 1912, you would have found this article. And this was a little story about how the consumption of coal was leading to, or would lead to, warming of the climate. And it noted that the effect may be considerable in a few centuries. Now, we think of this as an issue that has just arrived on the scene and one that uh, was, was dreamt up by various people for various reasons. But in fact, that the science of climate change goes back into the 19th century. And the first person who um, actually looked at this issue in terms of the relationship between the level of CO2 in the atmosphere and the temperature on the surface was this guy, a Swedish chemist named Svante Arrhenius. And he published uh, an article back in 1896 which talked about this relationship. And, and he calculated just on, 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 you know, with pencil and paper that if you doubled the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, you'd probably get about four to five degrees of warming. And today, with all the, you know, the computational um, energy that's put behind this, the, the science hasn't changed. The, the computational energy helps us understand what this means, what it means in some cases right down to a very local level. But nevertheless, the science that is, is in these models is basically the same science that Arrhenius used over 100 years ago. Now, Arrhenius was thinking about carbon dioxide. So let's just take a little journey on, on what carbon dioxide might look like. If you had a, a ton of carbon dioxide, this is, this is what it would look like. And that would come from about 120 gallons of gasoline. So if you're driving one of the, the sort of the large SUVs or trucks that you see in the streets of Aspen, uh, that's probably, what, two or three fills of one of those. And of course, this is being added to the atmosphere all the time through our use of fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas, through land use change, and through many of the agricultural practices around the world. And it's contributing about uh, 107 million tons of CO2 per day is being added to the atmosphere. And underneath that is, is Manhattan. Hopefully, you recognize it. But that's just to give you some visualization of the, the scale of which we're changing the composition of the atmosphere through human activities around the world. And we can measure the CO2 in the atmosphere, and, and that has been something that's been on now since 1958, when the, the first uh, accurate measurement of atmospheric CO2 was developed. And what we see is a, is a rising trend of atmospheric CO2. Um, back when Arrhenius was doing his calculations, the level in the atmosphere was probably about 280 parts per million. Today, we're at around 410 parts per million. And the rate of change is accelerating as well. So 
we're adding more and more to the atmosphere, and the rate at which it's increasing is adding as well, is, is going up. Now, that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, uh, as Arrhenius calculated, is changing the surface temperature. And this is a relationship that's well understood, as I said, and is very observable. This is the temperature trend for the last um, 60, seven, nearly 70 years. And, uh, and what we see is, is a rising trend, but it's, it's quite a noisy trend. So what you'll see is that you get periods where, where not much happens. You get periods where there's quite sharp jumps in temperature. And this is all affected by more um, periodic climate events, such as the El Nino Southern Oscillation. These are the big changes in temperature in the, in the Pacific Ocean that occur every few years as a result of changes in currents. If you strip out this noise and just try and look at the underlying data, what you see is a pretty clear trend of getting up towards 0.2 degrees C per decade of warming. And that doesn't sound a lot, but it's rapid when you consider the Paris Agreement is aiming to limit warming to as little as 1.5, and we're at 1 today. So you can do the maths. That's, that's sort of 25 years away in terms of uh, warming potential. Now, thinking back to the article in the, the Braidwood Dispatch in 1912, it talked about coal. And so I've been here for about five minutes, and in that time, this is how much coal has been produced in the world. And of course, I could show a similar picture for, for oil and for natural gas. And, and there's another fossil fuel which we don't think a lot about is, is we, we extract a lot of limestone from the ground, which we heat to make cement. And when you do that, CO2 is released as well. Now, this coal forms part of the energy system that drives and runs everything that we do. It's a very large system, and, and this is an, a sort of an illustration of what that system looks like. Now, on the right hand, oh, sorry, on the left hand side of the picture is what we call primary energy. So, primary energy is the energy that we, we extract from the ground, or we can capture from the sun, or we can capture from the wind. And we convert that through processes like refining into final energy, which is the energy that you use to deliver energy services. So you use electricity when you turn the light on and you get illumination. You use gasoline, which is a hydrocarbon over on the right-hand side. You put it in your car and you get mobility. Now, the reality of the energy system today is that it's about 80% fossil fuels. And if I'd been in this room 30 years ago giving this talk long before there was you know, big changes in, in renewables and things, I'd have said, well, the, the, the amount of fossil fuels in the energy system is about 80%. It hasn't changed at all in 30 years. So this is a very slow-moving system, and that's been the story of it for the, for the 150 years that it's been developing. It's so slow, in fact, that there are elements of it that would be familiar to a person who might come from Braidwood in 1912. And uh, one example of that is this. Whoops. So this on the, uh, on the, the, the left-hand side is the engine from a, a Ford Model T. And on the right-hand side is the very latest Mazda internal combustion engine. And you really wonder about you know, the level of progress in the energy system when you see a picture like that. And of course, you think, well, everything's changing, and, and we'll have new energy systems will emerge, and it'll all be all right. But in fact, there have been lots of false starts along the way. And uh, one false start is this. So if I was back in 1900, and I was looking at the cars in the United States, a third of them were electric. And in fact, this car was made um, by a company in Denver. And I suspect that you won't find that company going today. So, of course, what happened was that the, the Ford Model T came along, John Rockefeller came along with uh, abundance of crude oil, companies like Shell competed against him, and the, the energy system went off in a completely different direction to the one that uh, people like Thomas Edison was hoping that it might develop in back in, uh, in the early 1900s. So 
we've come, this, we've come through this journey over the last hundred or so years, knowing about the climate issue, watching the energy system very slowly evolve, and we finally arrive in 2015 where we recognize we really need to do something about this issue, about the warming of the climate system, and so came the Paris Agreement. But even the Paris Agreement took 25 years to land, and there were a number of false starts in that process as well. I, I'm sure many people have heard of the Kyoto Protocol, seen as the, the, the global deal from 1997. Got out of the gates, everybody started doing it, but it progressively just fell apart over the years and really didn't deliver uh, a, a great deal at all. We had a failed attempt in 2009 in Copenhagen where the world came together to try and reach a global deal and it really just collapsed at the actual summit itself. But 2015, the Paris Agreement was, uh, was landed and we, we really need to look at the, the, the key goals of that agreement to understand where it's going to take us. The first is to limit warming to well below two degrees C, bearing in mind that we're at one degree C already and warming at 0.2 degrees C per decade. But the Paris Agreement also has a stretch goal to, to try and limit this as, as little as 1.5. One of the principal reasons for that is because there are differences between what happens in the global climate system at 2 and what happens at 1.5. The biggest of them being sea level change. And in fact, this need for 1.5 was pushed by a number of small island states who are really worrying about their existence over the course of this century and into next. Now, the Paris Agreement says that to achieve this temperature goal, you need to peak global emissions as soon as possible. And then it goes on to say in Article 4 of the agreement, this, this fairly complex bit of uh, uh, language, which is actually the key to the whole thing. And I'll read it out. It says, to achieve a balance between anthropogenic emissions by sources and removals by sinks of greenhouse gases in the second half of the century. And you wonder, what on earth does that mean? Because if we don't do that, we don't resolve this problem. So I put together this picture to try and illustrate what it means. So, the, so this, is, this is illustrative of where the energy system or the emission system might progress over the course of this century, and in fact where it needs to progress to solve this problem. So at the moment, we're back here. We're still seeing emissions rise. And emissions, although there was some plateau in the last few years, emissions have not yet peaked. But they need to do that quite quickly and then start to fall. Now, they, they need to reach this point somewhere later in the century where there's effectively no net emission of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And the reason for that is because this is a cumulative problem. It just gets worse and worse as you keep adding CO2, as you keep adding that mound over Manhattan every single day. And so until you stop adding that amount, and in fact bring that down to zero, you don't stop the overall rise in CO2 in the atmosphere and therefore the warming of the climate system. Now the Paris Agreement recognizes that in the course of this century, it's unlikely we're going to get to a point of absolutely no emissions. And we'll get into why that's the case shortly. So what it says is that somewhere in the second half of the century, you've got to get to a point where if there are still emissions, you're removing the same amount from the atmosphere, so the overall is zero. And in the sky scenario, we reach that point in 2070. And so this really, this picture is the essence of the Paris Agreement and the essence of the scenario that we're going to talk about tonight. Now the way the Paris Agreement is structured to try and deliver this outcome is based on what are called nationally determined contributions. So countries aren't told what to do. They tell the United Nations what it is they can do. They determine nationally what they can do in their own countries to reduce emissions, and they put that forward as their contribution for the next few years, and then they go back and they work on policies and changes in their energy system to deliver on, those, on that contribution. 
Now, of course, if you add up all these contributions, and the UN does that or will do that, you may not get to an emissions pathway that looks like the one in the picture that I just showed you. And so what the Paris Agreement has built into it is a process of review, assessment, and improve. So you review the national contributions, you assess the pathway on which they're taking the world's emissions, and if that's not equal to the pathway that you want to be on, then the process will call for everybody to come back with an improved offering. Now that sounds like, uh, that doesn't sound like a recipe for an assured outcome, and it isn't. But it's the deal that has been negotiated under this agreement, and it requires uh, an intense level of a national cooperation across boundaries to be able to achieve it. In thinking about the energy system throughout this century, we've also got to look at the way in which it's structured and some of the key issues that are there to be solved. The first one is that the energy system is still experiencing demand growth. The population of the world is still growing. But more importantly, within that population, there's billions of people moving from very modest incomes today to middle class incomes. And that expectation from them is very, very high. Then there's another two or three billion people moving from almost no income today to some modest income where they can at least afford and receive basic goods and services for a better life. And the combination of that is a big driver for the global energy system. Now we look at improvements in efficiency as a way of limiting overall demand growth, but efficiency has rebound within it. And aviation is a great example. You know, the technology hasn't really changed in the last 60 years. It's just got cheaper and cheaper and cheaper as it's become more and more efficient. And so it's gone from a luxury to something that's affordable to several billion people on the planet today. And they're all using it. The central part of the energy system, which is really very important, is coal. And coal remains a key element of many, many economies around the world. It's the principal element of several very large economies and has, of course, been the principal element of, of the United States economy and still remains very large in the US economy today. The reality is that here we are in the early part of the 21st century and that we still don't have all of the technologies lined up to offer a developing economy a route forward that industrializes them and offers them all the goods and services that we enjoy that doesn't include coal. And in fact, part of the workshop this week is to think about those types of solutions. There are a number of sectors out there that are not, easy, as, not as easy as others to decarbonize. So we've already clearly invented ways of decarbonizing the electricity sector. You can replace a coal-fired power station with winds and solar farms. But you can't do that yet for an aeroplane and some big industrial processes. But there are technologies out there which just aren't moving forward that can unlock some of those sectors using hydrogen, capturing and storing carbon dioxide geologically and le rather than letting it go up into the atmosphere, using biomass around the world and turning it into fuels. These are all technologies that can solve many of these issues but are not moving forward around the world at the, pro at the rate that's necessary. And of course, hovering over all this is the fact that, despite the fact we've had a, a, you know, 106 years notice from the, from the Braidwood newspaper, we've waited till the last moment to think about solving this problem. Imagine if we'd started 106 years ago when still a third of the cars in the United States were electric and we'd gone off in that direction rather than the direction we did. So to think about this issue and to think about the future and where it's taking us, in Shell we use scenarios. And just a quick word about scenarios. They're, I should say scenarios are not a forecast. I, I'm not forecasting the future tonight. I don't know what the future will entail. In the energy system, I can forecast fairly accurately where it will be next year and pretty much where it will be in 10 or 20 years because it's quite a slow-moving system and I've got a lot of data that tells me where it's going. 
But when you start thinking out in the further future, you know, out to 2070, where you're going to be at this point of net zero emissions, it's unclear how we might get there. It's also unclear whether we can get there fast enough or whether there may be disruptive technologies that come along that get us there even faster. And to think about those futures, we use scenarios. Scenarios are meant to test you out. They're meant to throw curveballs into the equation and surprise you. And then we use them a lot in Shell to really think about different futures so that we can think about investments that the company might make. Now, the sky scenario, which we're talking about tonight, sits within a, a family of scenarios that Shell has developed in recent years. And the matrix that I've put on the screen just gives you an idea of how challenging the sky scenario is. So sky is a scenario that meets the goals of the Paris Agreement, well below 2 degrees C. And it sits up in this top right-hand corner, and it's dependent on two big global trends that have to work and manifest. The first is the effectiveness of what we call mechanisms to share common interests. Now, the United Nations is a mechanism to share common interest. The Aspen Global Change Institute is a mechanism to share common interest at a, at a much lower level than the UN, but it, it's designed to bring people together to solve problems and resolve issues and, and, and share experiences. But that's not enough. You also have to have a strength of leadership to take these, these uh, uh, collaborations forward, to drive them in a particular direction. And the sky scenario needs both of these working at maximum effectiveness to succeed. Now, we saw this, I think, in 2015, where many, all the countries came together. They were supported by many other institutions, by business leaders, by civil society leaders, by city mayors, and they managed to get the Paris Agreement across the line and agreed. But even since then, this matrix has been challenged. It's been challenged, for instance, in the country I live in, the UK, because they voted to leave one of the key regional mechanisms to share common interests, the European Union. And of course, if you're not up in sky, then you're somewhere else. Now, that doesn't mean you're heading for a catastrophe. It means that you're probably not meeting the goals of the Paris Agreement. And we have other scenarios in these spaces that do eventually resolve the climate issue, but at to, you know, somewhere between two and three degrees. So let's look in more detail at Sky and about how it works and what it delivers. It starts off today with the recognition that if you add up the nationally determined contributions that countries have put forward, that they're not on a pathway that is equal to what you, the, the one you need to be on to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. They're not seeing an immediate peaking of global emissions. And they're certainly, therefore, not seeing any sort of trend downwards. This is still a rising emissions profile. And so Sky, in its early years, uses this five-year ratchet mechanism of the Paris Agreement that I talked about before to get rapid change in these nationally determined contributions. It imagines in the first review period, which has started already, started this year, that there's a wide resubmission of nationally determined contributions. And an example of the sort of change that's necessary is a country like China. Now, China, in its first uh, contribution, said that its emissions would plateau around about 2030. That has to shift to something like a rapidly falling emissions pledge. You have to see Chinese emissions peaking in the next few years for the whole world to start to move to this more aggressive uh, timetable that Sky has shown us. By the time you get to the second review period under the uh, Paris Agreement, so that's from 2023 to 2028, everybody is resubmitting their nationally determined contributions. And a country like India, which only gave an indication that emissions would, or it's the emissions intensity of its economy would start to fall, would have to be clear that it's emissions had peaked and would start falling in the 2030s. 
Now, these are very ambitious requirements for countries that are still on rapidly developing pathways. But these are very big countries that are now having a big influence on the total global emissions. And of course, the United States isn't out of the woods here either. It's also going to have to resubmit its nationally determined contribution, assuming, of course, it stays in the Paris Agreement. As this process gets going, Sky builds on six big steps forward. Those steps revolve around government policy. So car, we, we're going to talk about carbon pricing, energy efficiency, the electrification of the energy system, growing new energy systems very rapidly, making use of technologies like carbon capture and storage, and outside of the energy system, dealing with land use change, for example, by ending deforestation. Now, this isn't going to happen just because I'm saying so or because the UN has called for it or the Paris Agreement thinks we should do it. Society has to want this change. And so all of this is underpinned by not only a changing consumer mindset, but a societal license for change. People have to want this. They have to vote for it. They have to demand it. And they have to accept the changes in the system that come about as a result of all of this. The introduction of carbon pricing, for instance, means shifts in the relative, um, the, the relationship of price in various goods and services. People don't like that sort of change, but it, it, it has to happen. And it has to favor, for instance, less carbon intensive goods and discredit more carbon intensive goods. Carbon pricing throughout this century, and this is putting a cost on emitting CO2, will ratchet up very rapidly in this scenario. It goes from the position that we're in today, where there's very little use of carbon pricing globally, to a point by 2030, just 12 years away, where most countries are employing this policy mechanism, and they're putting a price on carbon that's up to about $65 per tonne. Now, in North America today, in California, there's a price on carbon of around about, I think it's around about $15 per tonne. In British Columbia, in Canada, it's at $30 per tonne. But by the time you get over to the eastern states, where there's a, a, a collaboration between a few states, it's, it's $3 or $4 per tonne. And in most of North America, it's zero. The second big step is around improving our, rapidly improving the efficiency of energy use. And the reason for doing that is that we know that there's very high demand for energy services, for goods and services, and that's pushing up energy demand globally. And one way of at least modifying that demand and limiting its overall growth is to make energy services more efficient. It doesn't mean that demand flattens or starts to go down but at least it limits it to some extent. And the reason for doing this is that it allows the new energy systems a chance to catch up. And these new energy systems like solar and wind are still a long, long way behind. Today, the annual increase in global electricity demand is not met by the increasing amount of solar and wind that is being uh, deployed. So we're still not even catching up to our incremental change, let alone actually cutting in to the large base of coal and natural gas-fired power stations that already exist. And so energy efficiency allows that catch-up to happen more easily. The sort of changes that are required are akin to the changes that we've seen in the last 50 years. In the industrial processes, in transport, and in commercial and domestic buildings, residential, seen big changes in the efficiency of appliances, the efficiency of processes like steel making, and even the efficiency of your own car. And we have to see all of that or more happen again in the next 50 years. The next big lever is around the use of electricity. Now at the moment, if, I, if you use gasoline in your car, you have carbon dioxide emissions coming from your car. And there's really nothing you can do about that. 
But if you use, for instance, electricity in your car, then when you drive down the street, there are no emissions at all. And even if there's emissions associated with the generation of that electricity back at the power station, it can be managed at a large scale where the electricity is generated. So the more electricity we can use in society to deliver energy services, the more we can centralize the whole process of managing carbon dioxide. Now, we've had 100 years of electrification of society. And to be honest, it's moving very slowly. Electricity makes up just 20% of the energy that we use. So 80% of the energy we use isn't electricity. And it continues to grow at around about two percentage points per decade. In this scenario, we see a tripling of the rate of electrification. And that tripling starts off in the early years with a big change and a big push towards electric passenger vehicles. By 2030 in the sky scenario, nearly half the cars globally being sold are electric. And by the time you get to the early 2040s, it's game over to, the, to a large extent for the internal combustion engine. Now that's new car purchases. Of course, the removal of the, the older legacy cars from the system takes quite a bit longer. But what you see is, even though we, as we go through the century, we have seen over a tripling of uh, demand for mobility services, a rapid shift to electrification, and in fact, a fall in energy demand, even for a tripling of um, of use. And that's because of the efficiency that electrification brings you compared to an internal combustion engine. Now we also imagined in Sky that we might enter a different period of, of how cars are made. You know, electric cars are really all going to be the same. They're going to be a battery pack and an electric motor and wheels. And perhaps we work, move into a world where this is what comes off the assembly line and that the differentiation that people enjoy in their cars, which these days they sort of focus on the motor rather than what the car looks like, comes through bespoke local fabrication of the body itself. So that's just a thought as to you know, how cars might change. But nevertheless, rapid electrification is one of the early changes in the sky scenario. New, big new energy systems emerge in this scenario, and they emerge very rapidly. By the time you get to the end of the century, the principal source of energy on this planet is solar. It makes up about a third of the energy mix, the primary energy mix. And along with wind, nuclear, and biomass, you've got about 80% um, of the energy system. That's a complete reversal of where we are today, where it's 80% fossil fuels. Now, fossil fuels haven't disappeared completely, and that's simply, be, but for the most part, by the end of the century, they're being used to make goods, plastics, fertilizers, all these things that we use where fossil fuels are the feedstocks. And they still exist in a number of areas where hydrocarbon liquids are very important, and aviation is a great example. Of course, the result of all these changes is very rapid change in fossil fuel demand. In the sky story, coal has already peaked. There's no further increase in the global demand for coal. It plateaus for a few years, and that plateau is because there's still lots of new coal-fired power stations coming in that are under construction in large parts of Asia. But that, that is being offset by the fact that coal is diminishing in countries like the United States, across Europe, Australia, Japan, and other places. Coal then goes into decline. And it goes into a rapid decline initially because natural gas, being the big scalable technology that's there today, is pushing it out. You're getting your first step drop in emissions because of natural gas. But then by the time you get to 2040, wind and solar have scaled to the point where they're now pushing out both coal and natural gas and the whole power generation starts, system starts to rapidly change. Now, oil peaks quite early in this story, as early as 2025, and that's because of the rapid electrification of passenger vehicles. But its initial decline is quite slow, 
because other sectors that oil is used in, and aviation is a good example, are still growing very rapidly. By the time you get out to 2050, oil starts to set into a second uh, and steeper decline. And that's because alternatives are starting to enter the market that can actually replace oil in some of its very long-term uses. And we'll come, we'll come to that in a moment. In the final energy system, so this is the energy that you use, of course, there's a rapid transition to electricity. It goes from 20% to over 50% of our energy use. But energy-dense molecular fuels, so liquids and gas, remain important because they deliver important energy services. They deliver high temperatures into industrial processes. They deliver um, energy into mobile transport, you know, like aviation and shipping. Some of the heavy transport, the, the big rigs that go across the United States delivering goods, they are still important in the overall story. Now, within this final energy system, new, smaller energy systems emerge. And a great example is hydrogen. Hydrogen is a great energy carrier, but it's hardly used today. Although we have all the technologies to make it and deploy it, if we want to, it's been used in industrial processes for decades. Hydrogen can make its way into the transport sector through fuel cells. It can make its way into the building sector, uh, potentially for heating. But it can also make its way into industrial processes uh, for heating and for transformation. And so hydrogen plays an important role. It can be manufactured from natural gas and the carbon dioxide captured and stored. Or you can use electricity from solar energy to make hydrogen directly. And in fact, that is what happens in the sky scenario. Hydrogen emerges in a number of different places. And by the end of the century, it's reaching the, a similar scale to the natural gas industry globally today. It's a very big technology, although it looked small on that previous graph because the overall energy system has expanded. One example of the emergence of hydrogen could be in aviation. It's a rapidly growing sector, and we have to find a solution. And hydrogen is one that we see has the potential to emerge, but not until the second half of the century. That, the, the technologies behind that are, are barely out of the laboratory today. And so, like many technologies in Sky, if it's not scalable now, don't expect to see it for 30, maybe 40 years down the track. Now, with all of these changes in the energy system, emissions, of course, rapidly falling. But there's still a lot of fossil fuel left in the system. And we still have to reach that balance that I talked about under the Paris Agreement as early as 2070. And of course, if you want to be even more ambitious on temperature, you have to reach it even earlier. So we need to introduce a big new technology or at least a technology that we know and understand, but is hardly deployed today. And that's carbon capture and storage. This is where you capture carbon dioxide at the point of emissions, and you compress it and store it <coughs> geologically, typically three to four kilometers below the surface. Sometimes it's going back into depleted gas reservoirs, places where there was natural gas before. Other times, it's going into similar geological formations, which are just available and where you can store CO2 quite safely. Now, Sky also uses a particular version of carbon capture and storage, and that is it's linking it with it's the use of bioenergy. Now, bioenergy is an important component of this story, and let me explain why. When you grow a crop, an energy crop, so it might, be, it might be sustainable forestry, it might be corn, sugar cane, uh, it might be various prairie grasses, whatever it is you're growing, you're absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. That's how plants grow. You then take that biomass and you convert it through some process into an energy product. Now, of course, the simplest is you could burn it in a power station and generate electricity. But there are lots of other processes that are available in the world today. And in the US, there's a big process where you convert corn into ethanol, which substitutes for gasoline. 
Along that process, that chain, if you can capture CO2 and geologically store it, then you're effectively removing CO2 from the atmosphere. And that delivers a negative emission process that we call a sink. And you'll see why we need sinks in a moment. Now, there's a great example of a sink in the United States today. If you go to Illinois, uh, to one of the corn ethanol plants, they're capturing the CO2 from the fermentation of the, uh, of the corn. And they're compressing it and geologically storing it. So that corn ethanol plant is negative in terms of carbon dioxide emissions. So we know how to do this, but of course we don't do it because there's no sort of commercial incentive to implement it. But if you have a price on carbon dioxide emissions, that drives you to these sorts of processes because you get a financial return for actually doing this rather than paying to emit CO2. Now, the fundamental aspect of the Paris Agreement is achieving this balance between remaining emissions and sinks so that you have no net release of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So let's have a look at how that happens in the sky story. But we start our journey in 2020 with the energy system that we've got today. And it com consists of three parts. On the left-hand side is what we call the non-emitting sector. So this is wind, solar, and nuclear, for example. In the center is our fossil fuel energy system. And all these numbers are in tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. So we extract fossil fuel from the ground. And most of it, after it's given up its energy, ends up as carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. This is the mound over Manhattan that you saw earlier in the story. Now, some of it goes into products, and these range from plastics to bitumen. But we also have a third energy system. It's very large in the United States. It's the corn ethanol system, but it's in other parts of the world as well. So you grow some corn. It absorbs CO2 from the atmosphere. You turn it into ethanol. You use it in your car, and of course, the carbon dioxide comes out through the tailpipe and back in the atmosphere. So that's a closed loop. Now, this system is going to change as a result of all the changes we've talked about. By 2050, it starts to look like this. On the left-hand side, the non-emitting sector has, of course, grown quite large. In the center, there's a lot of things have changed. We've seen the use of fossil fuels really starting to decline. But notice that the emissions to atmosphere have dropped by even more nearly half compared to 2020. The use of fossil fuels into end-use products continues to grow as global economies grow and as, as people move into middle class. But we've added carbon capture and storage to many of the industrial processes around the world that are using fossil fuels, to cement plants, to steel mills, um, to petrochemical plants, and so on. On the right-hand side is the bioenergy system. And it's got much bigger than it was in 2020. And it's also been linked with carbon capture and storage. So we've got a net removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere from this expanding bioenergy system. By the time we get to 2070, the whole system is even bigger again. But there's now no net emissions. So we're still using fossil fuels. It's, down to, it's heading down towards about a third of where we were in 2020. We've still got carbon capture and storage here. Even more fossil fuels are going into end-use products. The bioenergy system has got even larger. The non-emitting sector over here, very, very large indeed. And the overall outcome is no emissions from the global energy system. By the time we get to 2100, the global energy system is actually drawing down carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So you're actually starting to correct an imbalance that has built up over the last two centuries. And you've built an industry that can potentially, in the 22nd century, correct that imbalance even more. Now, 
the sky scenario doesn't just end in the energy system. A good part of the emissions that are coming from human activities around the world come from other areas. In fact, about a third come from land use change, other greenhouse gases, agricultural processes. So the next big step in sky is to make changes in these as well. And the first step is an end to deforestation by 2070. Today, the world is deforesting at a phenomenal rate, and that, that process has to end. All the other greenhouse gases have to start to change as well. So, for instance, the uh, agricultural system releases both carbon dioxide and methane. Now, these don't go away, but certainly through sharing of best practice, farming communities around the world can see a reduction in those greenhouse gases. But it requires, again, like every other step in the sky story, a lot of cooperation at national level and at international level to share best practice, to make sure that the farmers in southern Africa are using the same techniques as the farmers in the United States to maximize their yields and minimize their impact on the environment. That's what has to happen everywhere. And so you see a decline in the other greenhouse gases as a result. Now in Shell, we have a lot of capacity to model the energy system, but we don't have the tools to model the climate system. So we worked with MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, to look at how the sky scenario plays out in the climate system. And so they remodeled our scenario in their climate energy models. And this is the outcome that they got. So the blue line that flattens out at 1.75 degrees C is the output from the sky scenario. That's the temperature goal that this scenario can deliver. If we can reach net zero emissions by 2070 and grow these energy systems and make all these changes in, this, in the next 50 years, we can limit the warming to well below 2 degrees C. That's the same as saying you've got an 85% chance of being below 2 degrees C in 2100. Now, think about that matrix back at the beginning. And you perhaps, you know, you don't quite have that level of cooperation that delivers these changes as rapidly as are required. You're perhaps in our mountains and oceans scenario, which also reach net zero emissions, but not till the end of the century. And they end up, therefore, around two and a half degrees C. So not meeting the goals of the Paris Agreement, but also not taking us into completely unknown, temperature, uh, unknown territory of four degrees or five degrees or worse in terms of warming. Now, the Paris Agreement has this second stretch goal within it, to try and limit warming to as little as 1.5 degrees C. And so we worked with the guys at MIT to think about what has to happen for that goal to be reached. And it's not just about speeding up the energy transition, because we've already maxed that out, at least as far as we can imagine today. So you have to think of something else you have to do on a very large scale, globally, to take more CO2 out of the atmosphere than we're already taking. And that step is reforestation. So it's not just an end to deforestation by 2070. It's actually massive reforestation. And the level of reforestation that you need is that in the next 30 to 40 years, you have to reforest globally the equivalent of an area the size of Brazil. And this is not just in Brazil. This is everywhere adding up to an area the size of Brazil. In my own country, it's uh, uh, the equivalent of um, the Australian contribution would be about the size of the state of Victoria. In, in India, which is another one I looked at, it's, their contribution is um, an area the equivalent of the state of Rajasthan. So these are very, very large reforestation projects all over the world that have to take place. And then you end up potentially at 1.5 degrees C. And of course, that's in addition to this enormous energy transition as well. So to finish off, you know, where are we today? So this is the, this is the energy system that we have today. It's, it's, it's a system that's 
the backbone of which is fossil fuels. And in fact, the predominant backbone, because it makes its way into absolutely everything, is oil. We use, of course, a lot of coal and natural gas, but oil ends up in everything, in our transport, in all our products, in our homes, everything. The transition that Sky requires sees energy systems being built on this scale. This is the world's largest solar farm. It's in the uh, California desert. You need 50,000 of these in the next few decades. Something like a million very large wind turbines around the world. And this is Shell's carbon capture and storage plant in Canada. We need 10,000 of these around the world. And then you end up with an energy system that looks like this. The backbone is no longer fossil fuels. The backbone of this energy system is electricity, driven largely by solar, but wind and nuclear as well, and utilizing, turning, turning some of that energy into hydrogen, and then utilizing other resources like biomass to produce liquid fuels, to produce hydrogen, and so on. But it's not a world without fossil fuels, because they're still used in a number of services, although they're declining all through the century. And so you have to match this up with large-scale use of carbon capture and storage. If you're interested in the, the sky scenario, and I hope uh, I've given you a taster of it tonight, you can download a book from the, uh, from the Shell website that talks more about it. Uh, if you're really into the numbers behind Sky, we have a, a spreadsheet with all the data on it and a website that's, uh, th that's expanding actually all the time with different aspects of the story being brought forward on different days. If you also feel inclined, I, I have a book that uh, I've written about the, the climate issue and that's, that's available on Amazon. But for now, thank you very much, and uh, hopefully you've got time for some questions.